Questions 8 through 10 on the 2019 Grade 12 Euclid Math Contest. A circle has center O and radius 1, quadrilateral ABCD has all four sides tangent to the circle at points P, Q, S, and T. As shown, also AOB is equal to BOC is equal to COD is equal to DOA. If AO is 3, determine the length of DS. So here is this diagram, and we have to now interpret this. The first thing, of course, is I'm going to draw the tangent points right there and right there. And I think I will keep it simple and just draw one more line to D. All the rest of the diagram I don't think I will need. So let's just keep it simple like that. Now, this is a very interesting thing that they told me, that all those angles are equal. I don't know why they wrote it like that. They could have just told me that they're 90. Because those angles just basically chop the uh, diagram into quarter segments. And if all of them are equal, then all of them together must equal 360, and each must be 90. So instead of telling us that they're 90, they told us that they're all equal. Anyhow, it just means that AOD or DOA is 90 degrees. So this is 90 degrees right here. All right. Another thing we know for sure that since T is a tangent point, that also is 90 degrees. So we have a similar triangle situation. If I call that theta, I hope you will be able to see that triangle AOD is similar to triangle ATO. They have the same angles. They have all, both of those share the theta, and both of those have a 90. So that means the third angle will be the same. It'll be 90 minus theta. Okay, so in a very careful way, let's use that to figure out the ratio of the sides. AO over DO will be the same as AT over TO. AO, they told me the question, is 3. And then DO, I don't know yet. And AT, that I also don't know. But TO, I know. TO is just the radius of the circle, which is 1. That was given in the question. So cross multiplying 3 is equal to DO times AT. All right, now where do we go from here? Well, Pythagoras, Pythagoras will definitely help us. And there's quite a few uh, right triangles where we can use Pythagoras. I'll just use, uh, I guess, this one first, this triangle right here. ATO. And on that, AT, which is something I don't know yet, plus TO, which is 1 squared, because that's the radius, is equal to AO squared, which is 3 squared. So that means AT squared is equal to 9 minus 1, which is 8. So AT is root 8. All right, so that means I can plug that back into here. So I get DO times root 8. And therefore, DO is equal to 3 over root 8. All right, I think I just have one more Pythagorean relationship, and that would be involving TD and DO, since those are the ones that I would need to figure out. So this one right here, that triangle. So that would give me that TO squared, which is 1 squared, plus TD squared is equal to do squared, which would be 3 over root 8, all squared. So that means td squared is equal to 9 over 8, and then bring the 1 over. So that means td squared is equal to 1 over 8, and therefore td is equal to 1 over root 8. All right, we are done with the question. Well, not really, right? They, I want you to figure out ds. I figured out td. But some of you know the following rule, that if you have a point, and that point in this question is D, and it touches the circle at two tangent points, there's one tangent point, and there's another tangent point. T and S represent tangent points, according to the question stem. Then those two segments are equal. So that means that TD is equal to DS. And we just figured out the value for TD is 1 over root 8. 
And of course, you can uh, multiply top and bottom by root eight. You know, rationalizing the denominator. And when you do, you get root eight over eight. And you can further. This is two root two over eight, uh, which is what root two over four. So you can further make it prettier, I guess. In any case, that is the answer to this question, DS. Suppose that x satisfies 0 less than x less than pi over 2 and cos of 3 over 2 cos x is equal to sine 3 over 2 sine x. Determine all possible values of sine 2x. Express your answers in the form a pi squared plus b pi plus c over d where a, b, c, and d are integers. There is an identity, one of many trig identities, that states that the cos of pi minus 2 over subtract theta is equal to the sine of theta. And even if you didn't remember that, you can figure that out just from the graphs, which I'm sure a lot of you have memorized by heart. Here's the sine graph, and here is an attempt at the cos graph. And as you can see, when you take a value of theta and you take the sine, and then you take that value of theta and subtract it from pi over 2, which is 90, you get the same result. For example, when theta is 90, which would be right here approximately, the sine of 90 is 1, right there. And then if you take 90 and subtract from it theta, which I had chosen to be 90, this would be 0. And the cos of 0 is 1. So you can keep doing that with other values of theta to prove or to convince yourself that this identity indeed holds true. So, because it holds true, now we can compare it to that. That means that this guy right here is my 3 over 2 cos theta. Or, actually, they're using x. So that is what that represents. And then this is going to represent my theta. 3 over 2 sine theta. Sine x. All right, so... Let's put it out in an equation format. 3 over 2 cos x is equal to pi over 2 minus theta. And then the other guy gives me that 3 over 2 sine x is equal to theta. So I might as well substitute this guy here into there. So it would be 3 over 2 cos x is equal to pi over 2 minus theta, which is my, uh, minus 3 over 2 sine theta. Multiply through by 2, definitely get rid of that fraction, and then put everything on one side. 3 cos x uh, plus 3 sine x is equal to pi. So factor out the 3 cos x plus sine x is equal to pi over 3. All right, now where do we go from here? Well, we have to figure out the values of sine 2x. And if you remember, sine 2x, I'll write it up here, that's one of the more common identities that usually people have no problem remembering. It's 2 sine x cos x. All right, well, I've got this. How do I go from there to there? Well, I think I will square both sides. If I do, that will help me. That will give me cos squared x plus 2 sine x cos x plus sine squared x is equal to pi squared over 9. Now, there's another identity which is probably the most common identity, probably the most popular one in my opinion, and that is the sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to 1 identity. And that's pretty much what we have here with this and this guy. So this equation becomes 1 plus 2 sine x cos x is equal to pi squared over 9. And then this is sine 2x. So it worked out. So sine 2x, if you isolate for it, it would be pi squared, minus, pi squared over 9 minus 1. And then for some strange reason, 
they want me to put it in that form. I'm not entirely sure why, but we can do that. So I guess we have to get a common denominator, pi squared minus 9 over 9. And that equals uh, a pi squared plus b pi plus c over d. And I think that's it, right? Do they want me to figure out a, b, c, and d? I'm not sure. Well, might as well just write it in. A looks like it's 1. B is 0. There is no pi. C looks like it's negative 9. And D looks like it's 9. So there you go. This is the form. That completes 8B. For positive integers A and B, define F at AB to be A over B plus B over A plus 1 over AB. For example, the value of one F12 one is 3. Determine the value of F25. F at 25, that's going to be 2 over 5 plus 5 over 2 plus 1 over 2 times 5. So that looks like if you get a common denominator, 2, 2, 5, 5. So 4 plus 25 plus 1 all over 10. That's 30 over 10, and that is 3. So that takes care of part A. Part B, determine all positive integers A for which f at a a is an integer. So f at a a is an integer. So that's going to be a over a plus a over a plus 1 over a times a, which is a squared. So this is some integer. I don't know what integer that is. A over a is 1, a over a is 1, so then I have 1 over a squared. So this is 2 plus 1 over a squared. And a is a positive integer, okay? So the only way this is going to turn into an integer is I think if a equals 1. I think that's the only way. Because a is positive, so it can't be negative 1, and obviously it can't be 0 because that would make it undefined. And if I put any other integer greater than 1, like 2, 3, this becomes a fraction and therefore this whole thing would no longer be an integer. So a equals 1 is the only solution to part b. If a and b are positive integers and f at a b is an integer, prove that f at a b must be a multiple of 3. We are going to prove this by contradiction. And what that means is that we assert something, and then we later prove that that something is no longer not possible to be true. So therefore, our original assumption was false. So this is what I'm going to assume. We'll let f at a b be some something. Uh, we'll let it equal k. It doesn't really matter. And then we are going to say that it is not a multiple of 3. And therefore, we are going to show what happens. And at the end, we will show that we have concluded something false. And therefore, k must be a multiple, three, multiple of 3 since our an original uh, assumption was false. So here we go. k is not a multiple of 3. So we have let f at a, b equals k. So k is equal to a over b plus b over a, plus 1 over a, b, from this definition up there. So as always, we are going to get a common denominator. So that's going to be uh, top and bottom by a, top and bottom by b. So that gives me a squared plus b squared plus 1 over a, b. So that means k, a, b is equal to a squared plus b squared plus 1 and put everything on one side, and we will get 0 is equal to a squared minus kba plus b squared plus 1. So I put it in that form for a reason, to make it look like a quadratic, basically. OK, so now let's use the quadratic formula to solve for a. It's a little un unconventional, but it'll, it'll work. 
So that'll be KB plus or minus the square root of KB minus KB squared minus 4AC, so B squared plus 1. And that's all over 2, as you know. So this is going to be KB plus or minus K squared B squared minus 4B squared minus 4. And that is all over 2. Now, A is an integer, this A right here. The only way it's going to be an integer is if this is an integer, right? Otherwise, you're going to have a square root. And the only way that's going to be an integer is if what's inside the radical is a perfect square. And what is inside the radical is known, as I'm sure you know, as the discriminant. Discriminant. So that discriminant has to be a perfect square. So, for example, 16. And therefore, when you take the square, it would be 4. And that would work, help you develop an integer. So, that means that my k squared b squared minus 4 b squared minus 4, the discriminant, has to be a perfect square. So that is pretty much now what I have to try to show is possible or not. If it is not possible, then it will prove that k not being equal to 3m was a false assumption, and therefore k must be equal to 3m. So here we go. We have to show this is a perfect square. Now we have concluded earlier that k is not equal to 3m. So if k is not equal to 3m, then k must be either 3m plus 1, or k must be equal to 3m plus 2. Because if it's 3m plus 3, then it goes back to being a multiple of 3 again. All right, so that's where we are headed with this question. So let's take this now and let's work with it. So we have k squared b squared minus 4b squared minus 4. I'm going to change this. Well, I can't change it, but I can modify it. First, I can factor out a b squared. That will help. Be k squared minus 4. And then I can factor that. k minus 2, k plus 2, minus 4. All right, so let's see what happens. We have said that k is not a multiple of 3. Therefore, it must be either of that form or that form. Let's see what happens first with that form. If k is 3m plus 1, substitute that in, and we get the following. b squared times, let's see here, 3m minus 1 times 3m plus 3 minus 4. Okay, that's interesting, because this is a multiple of 3. So that basically, if I factor out that 3, I get b squared 3m minus 1, and I get m plus 1 minus 4. So I can just write this as 3b squared times some number, whatever that is, minus 4. And if you want to get really fancy, you can. You can further manipulate this a little bit. 3b squared and um, minus 6 plus 2 and then you can factor out a 3 once more, and you'll get b squared n minus 2 plus 2. All right, so we'll talk about this. That is basically a multiple of 3 plus 2. Okay, a multiple of 3 plus 2. Great. So that was for k equals 3m plus 1. Now let's do it for k equals 3m plus 2. Same sort of story, k is equal to 3m plus 2. And again, we're working with this discriminant right here that I factored into that format. So when I put 3k, uh, k is equal to 3m plus 2 for the discriminant, I get b squared. Here's the discriminant right there. It's going to be 3m, and the 2's cancel, and then 3m plus 4. And then don't forget that minus 4. So again, I factor out that 3, and I'm left with b squared. And then 
I've got m times 3m plus 4 minus 4. So again, I've got 3b squared times some number, whatever it is. Let's just call it n minus 4. And as before, if you want to be fancy, we can make this uh, minus 6 plus 2, factor out a 3 once again, and we get b squared n minus 2 plus 2. So we get the same result, interestingly. Yeah, same result. Oh, sort of, I guess. It, it would only be the same result if, if this was equal to that. But basically what I'm saying is the same form. Okay, so that means that we have a multiple of 3 plus 2. And our goal was to make it a perfect square, right? It has to be discriminant, it has to be a perfect square in order to make a into an integer. Well, is a multiple of 3 plus 2 a perfect square? Let's see. Every perfect square has to be of the following form. It's either 3q, 3q plus 1, or 3q plus 2, all squared. Right? You take some number. Every number is either a multiple of 3, or 1 plus a multiple of 3, or 2 plus a multiple of 3. And then you square them. This one just gives you 9q squared. Okay? This one gives you 9q squared plus 6q plus 1, which, if you factor out a 3, is 3q squared plus 2q plus 1. This one gives you 9q squared plus 6, or rather 12q plus 1. And again, if you factor out a 3, you get 3q squared plus 4 q plus 1. So as you can see, a perfect square is going to be either a multiple of 3, like this, or a multiple of 3 plus 1, like this guy, or a multiple of 3 plus 1, like that guy. It will never be a multiple of 3 plus 2. So in conclusion, every perfect square is either a multiple of 3 or a multiple of 3 plus 1. Therefore, since it can never be a multiple of 3 plus 2, our original assumption that k is not a multiple of 3 must be false. So let me write that out in a sentence format. Since every perfect square is a multiple of 3 or a multiple of 3 plus 1, a perfect square can never be a multiple of 3 plus 2. Therefore, k cannot be 3m plus 1, and k cannot be 3m plus 2. Therefore, k must equal 3m. And that proves what we were trying to prove at the very beginning. We assumed that k was not a multiple of 3, and then we said, okay, it must be either 3m plus 1 or 3m plus 2. For both of those, we found a form for the discriminant, and we had to get the discriminant to be a perfect square in order for a to be an integer. And we have shown that these two forms, which are essentially the same form, can never be a perfect square, because perfect squares can never be a multiple of 3 plus 2. Therefore, k cannot equal this guy or this guy. Therefore, it must be equal to 3m. And that is a complete solution to a relatively challenging question, 9c. Determine four pairs of positive integers a, b with 2 less than a less than b for which f at a, b is an integer. So from the first part right here, we had discovered that f at 2, 5 was equal to 3. Now, notice that f at a, b is symmetric, meaning it doesn't matter which order you put it in, f at a, b is going to be equal to f at b, a, like that. So because it's symmetric, we can conclude that f at 2, 5 will be equal to f at 5, 2, which is equal to 3. 
But in our case, they want B greater than A. So they want this guy to be bigger than this guy. Okay. So what I'm going to do is see what happens if I keep this 5, what will happen if I choose that to be B. So I'm going to keep the 5 and choose that to be B and see if I can get a value greater than 5 to satisfy this equation. Let's see what happens. Here's my formula. So off we go. So f at 5b is equal to 3. So substituting 5 and b into there, we get 5 over b plus b over 5 is equal to 1 over b times 5. So multiply top and bottom by 5, multiply top and bottom by b. So we have 25 plus b squared plus 1. And we can cross multiply and we get 15b. So put everything on one side and we get b squared minus 15b plus 26 is equal to 0. And I think this factors b, b, 13, and 2, negative, negative. So b is equal to 2 or 13. Well, the 2 we already knew, so we got a new one, 13. So that means f at 5, 13 is equal to 3. Great. It satisfies that inequality that b is greater than a. So I've got the first of my four pairs. So that is a, b is 5, 13. Great. So I've got to get three more. Okay, so same kind of story, right? It's symmetric, so if it's true for one order, it'll be true for the other order. So for example, f at 5, 13 should be the same as f, f at 13, 5. In fact, it is. And in the same kind of uh, process, I'm going to say, well, this is great, but it doesn't satisfy my inequality because this guy has to be greater. So I'm going to see if I just have 13 and then I put in a b, can I get some value that would work? Okay, same thing. So you use the same kind of story as we did before. So this is going to be 13 over b plus b over 13 plus 1 over 13 times b is equal to 3. So top and bottom by 13, top and bottom by b. So 169 plus b squared plus 1 is equal to 39b. So b squared minus 39b plus 170 is equal to 0. So factor this, and we get b, b, and 170, I think 34 and 5 should work. Negative, negative. So b is either equal to 5 or 34. All right, great. So the 5 I already knew, as you can see, um, that one was already there, but I got a new one, 34. So I got 13 and 34. And then you just continue this process a couple more times, and I'll let you do that because I think by now you understand it. And when you do, you'll get 34, and then the new value you get would be 89. And then you put the 89 here, and you do the same process, and the new value you get would be 233. And these will be the four that they're looking for. Amir and Bridget play a card game. Amir starts with a hand of six cards, two red, two yellow, and two green. Bridget starts with a hand of four cards, two purple and two white. Amir plays first. Bridget and Amir alternate turns. On each turn, the current player chooses one of their own cards at random and places it on the table. The card remain on the table for the rest of the game. A player wins and the game ends when they have placed two cards of the same color on the table. Determine the probability that Amir wins the game. So we have Amir and we have Bridget. So he has two red, two yellow, and two green. Bridget has two P and two W. All right, so let's see what happens. The first turn, Amir plays, and let's just, any card, let's say he places the red card. And that's fixed for now. We don't really need to worry about that. And then Bridget plays. She plays some card. Let's just say she places the purple card. 
again. Now, n nobody has one so far. Obviously, you need to have two cards of the same color. Now we get to the second term. Now, Amir could win if he places another R. What's the probability of that? Well, the probability of him getting another R, there's only five cards left. And of those five cards remaining, there's only one R. So the probability of him getting an R is 1 over 5. What's interesting about this question is that you only have to look at this probability. It doesn't matter what Bridget uh, placed, and it actually uh, doesn't matter what he placed there, except for the fact that it's R, and the probability is not looked at, because you can use that as sort of a fixed card and start from that point. So hopefully that makes sense, <laughs> and if it does, we move on. So one-fifth is the probability that he wins on the second turn. Okay, so let's do the same thing, but now we're moving ahead to first, second, and third turns. So let's say he places an R, she places a P. Nobody wins, of course. Second, in order for the game to continue, this cannot be an R. It, it can be either a yellow or it can be a green. So let's just say it's a yellow. If it's a yellow or a green, it cannot be an R. So the probability that it's not an R, there's five cards left, and there's one R left, so we do not want to choose that R, so we choose one of the other four. So that's the probability of getting, I guess a better way of writing this is not an R. Not R. Okay, so now we don't want uh, Bridget to win, so she can't put P, she has to put W. So what's the probability of her putting a W or choosing a W? Well, at this point, she's got three cards left. And of those three cards, two of them are W. So there's a two-thirds probability that she puts a W. OK, now we get to the third. For him to win, he's got to get an R. There's four cards left. And of those four cards, only one is an R. Or he can choose a card that this card was. So for example, if it was a yellow, he can choose that, which would be also the same probability, right? There's four cards left, and of those four cards, one would be a yellow. So it can be this or that, so we have to add those. So one quarter plus a quarter, and that is a half. So this has to happen, and this, and this. So we have to multiply those guys. Four over five times two over three times one over two. And when you do, you get four over 15. So that's the probability that Amir wins on the third turn. So this and this have to now be added to get the total. So 1 over 5 plus 4 over 15. And multiply top and bottom by 3. You get 3 plus 4 over 15. And that is 7 over 15 is the probability that Amir wins the game. Carlos has 14 coins numbered 1 to 14. Each coin has exactly one face called heads. When flipped, coins 1 through 14 land heads with probabilities H1, H2 until H14, respectively. When Carlos flips each of the 14 coins exactly once, the probability that an even number of coins lands heads is exactly a half. Must there be a K between 1 and 14 inclusive for which HK is a half? Prove your answer. Well, let's talk about the 14th coin being flipped a little bit later. Let's just first talk about what happens when the first 13 coins are flipped. So after the first 13 coins are flipped, what happens? Well, let the probability of an even number of heads be represented by P. So for example, you flip it 13 times and you get 10 heads and three tails. So 
even number of heads? Well, even number of heads, yeah, because 10 is an even number. So let the probability of an odd number of heads would obviously be the other aspect of it. So that would be 1 minus p. For example, if you had 9 heads, and since there was 13 coins being flipped, that would be 4 tails. All right, so that is the first part. Now we talk about the 14th coin that's flipped. And if the 14th coin is flipped, then the probability of heads is given by H14. And the probability of tails would be 1 minus h14. So, for example, if the 14th coin is a head and the first 13 coins give you a 9 and 4 scenario, then you would now have a 10 and 4 result. So this and this would give you an even number of heads. If the 14th coin is flipped and it's a tails, and then the first 13 gave you that scenario, then you'd have a 10 and 4 scenario as well for this and that. So that means if we combine all of these guys, we want an even number of heads. Both of these have an even number of heads. How do we get that? Well, the first was this and that, so we have to multiply those, 1 minus p times h14. And then add to that this and that, so we have to multiply those. So it would be 1 minus h14 times p. And they're telling you in the question that that is equal to a half, that the probability is exactly a half, that you get an even number of coins landing on heads. All right. So now I think I'm going to need a little bit more space. So let me just bring this equation up here. So I've got 1 minus p times h14 plus 1 or plus p times 1 minus h14, and that is all equal to a half. So expanding this and multiplying it out, I get uh, h14 minus p h14 plus p minus p h14. Multiply through by 2, and we'll get rid of the uh, fraction. And that is what you get when you multiply through by 2. And now let's put it all on one side. And when you do, you get the following collecting like terms. And now I think we can factor this. We can factor out a 2p. And when you do, you get 2h14 minus 1. And here we have minus 2h14 minus 1. So this factors out very nicely. 2h14 minus 1 and then 2p minus 1. So that means that this must be that h14 is equal to a half. Or if that is not true, then that means that p must be equal to a half. So if h14 is equal to a half, we're done. We have proven the question or we've answered the question the answer to the question is yes. If h14 is not equal to a half, then that means p must be equal to a half. That would mean that the probability of getting an even number of heads when the first 13 coins are flipped is a half. And we could repeat the same argument above to conclude that either h13 equals a half or the probability of obtaining an even number of heads when the first 12 coins is flipped is a half. Continuing in this way, Either one of h14 dot 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 until h2 will equal a half, or the probability of obtaining an even number of heads when one coin is flipped is a half. 
The last statement is equivalent to saying that the probability of obtaining a head with the first coin is a half, that is h1 is equal to a half. Therefore, at least one of h1, h2 until h14 must be equal to a half. Serge and Lis each have a machine that prints a digit from one to six. Serge machine prints the digits one through six with probability p1 through p6 respectively. Lis's machine prints the digits 1 through 6 with the probability q1 through q6 respectively. Each of the machines prints one digit. Let si be the probability that the sum of the two digits printed is i. If s2 equals s12 is equal to half of s7 and s7 is greater than 0, prove that p1 is equal to p6 or q1 is equal to q6. So let's understand this question in particular, what is si? si is the probability that the sum of the two digits printed is i. So for example, what is the probability that you have s2? Well, the only way you can get s2 if the sum of the two digits printed is 2. And the only way that can happen is if one digit is 1 and the other digit is 1. The probability of getting a digit 1 is p1. And the probability of getting a digit 1 from the other machine is also q1. So we need both of those to happen, so you have to multiply them. So s2 would be p1 times q1. In a very similar way, I want to calculate s12. The only way I can get s12 is if the sum of the two digits printed is 12. The only way that can happen is if I get a 6 and a 6. So 6 plus 6 would have to happen. The probability of getting a 6 is p6. Probability of getting a 6 with the other machine is q6. So we have to multiply those since both of those have to happen. So p6 times q6. That's s12. And now let's talk about s7. s7 has a lot more cases. We can get a 7 in the following ways. We can have a 1 from the first machine and a 6, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4, a 4 and a 3, a 5 and a 2, and a 6 and a 1. So using the same strategy and using these uh, numbers that would be as follows s7 would be p1 times q6 plus p2 times q5 plus p3 times q4 plus p4 times q3 plus p5 times q2 plus p6 times q1 and then now we approach this equation that s at 2 is equal to s at 12 is equal to 1 half s at 7 all right well individually they basically mean that s at 2 is equal to 1 half s at 7 and that s at 12 is equal to 1 half s at 7 if you were to add these you would get s at 2 plus s at 12 is equal to s at 7, a half plus a half. And then if you put everything on one side, you would basically get that s at 7 minus s at 2 minus s at 12 is equal to 0. So now we substitute these values. If you remember, s at 7 right here is this whole thing. So that's right here. And then s at 2 was p1 times q1. So there's p1 times q1. And s at 12 was p6 times q6, which is right there, p6 times q6. So it's all written out very nicely. And when you collect like terms and factor and all that stuff, you get to this final uh, spot in the equation. Now, this is a probability question, and probabilities are always either greater than or equal to zero, right? They could be zero, but they're most likely greater than zero, but we got to keep in mind that the zero can also happen. So this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's see what happens. First, I'm going to say that it is just greater than zero. I'm not going to worry about the zero from right now. Then later, I will make it equal to zero and see if that is needed. 
If this is greater than zero, then that means that P1 must be greater than P6, and Q1 must be greater than Q6. That's the only way, positive, positive. But we were told in the question that S2 is equal to S12. And therefore, if you remember the definitions, we're actually right here, we don't have to even go back. S2 is P1, Q1, and S12 is P6, Q6. If this is greater than that and that is greater than that, that would basically mean that P1, Q1 is greater than P6, Q6. Well, these two statements contradict each other, right? So obviously, this cannot be true. So that's no good. Now, let's say they're both negative. This is negative and this is negative. Negative times a negative is a positive. That could work. That would mean that P6 is greater than P1, and Q6 is greater than Q1. So again, S2 is equal to S12. So that means that P1, Q1 is equal to P6, Q6. If P6 is greater than P2 and Q6 is greater than Q1, that basically means that Q6 times P6 would be greater than P1, Q1. Well, again, these two statements contradict each other. So this cannot be true. So what is true is that this guy must have been equal to zero. So remember, it was greater than or equal to, so it looks like it can only be equal to. If it's equal to, then obviously that means that P1 is equal to P6, and Q1 is equal to Q6. And that is what they wanted you to prove, that those two are equal. P1 is equal to P6, and Q1 is equal to Q6. And there, go, there you go. That completes the proof for part C of number 10.